What is up down and sideways, you beautiful people. It is back with League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beauties. We've done it. We've reached the end. The dramatic conclusion that is LEC or EMEA, which I have not gotten into the habit of saying yet. 2023 officially behind us and it is G2 winning their 12th title. Three out of the four titles available in 2023 and now 10 titles for Mr. Caps in the mid lane. It's just another G2 era. About three or four weeks and possibly even more if you're a G2 faithful. Weeks have been waiting to see this one finally come through in the LEC. Yes, it is the conclusion of the 2023 full on season in the LEC and what they've got captured in there. And it is G2 standing tall at the end of it all and very convincingly so dispatching of their longtime rival in Fnatic in that finals matchup. Yeah, it's always delivers a G2 Fnatic final, even though it was pretty dominant in the way of G2. These were some explosive games. The first two, we were rocking a kill per minute for G2 alone in these matchups and kind of went as expected. You had a kind of whoopsie game from G2 that they still honestly almost came back from a terrible early game in game three, but those three wins were pure domination for the G2 squad. I don't care if you're saying the LEC at a general power level isn't at its highest there's no way shape or form that you are not excited about seeing this current power level g2 at worlds i think there's absolutely a uh, room to have a discussion about the power level of the lec and the rest of the competition but i think that there's also a space to have this conversation about just how far g2 has pushed themselves ahead of the competition throughout this split the way they've continued to level up, get better, more familiar, more comfortable together as a group where they can shine these individual moments, these star type of plays all across the board. You had Broken Blade multiple times busted it out in that top side. The way that Yike is there seemingly everywhere to find the right plays to get it going for G2. And of course, Caps in that mid lane leading the charge is big time for him. You have all five members now that you feel like there's at least one champion that should be permabanned against them, which pretty damn good advantage heading into pick ban when you feel that way. Uh, Broken Blade continues to, this is the best stretch of his career by far, probably. And I mean, he's had some pretty good moments throughout. He's no longer the kind of weak side, perhaps weakness of this G2 squad. It's hard to find any weaknesses, especially when they're also the most creative team in draft. All of a sudden, support Lissandra is styling on people. Oh man, it's dangerous. And I love that you bring up BB because this is one of these players that we had in the LCS and we got to see that potential still with some of the lessons that he had to be learning. And when he stepped over into the LEC, I think he took a good step in his career, still had some stuff to work on. I think this has been another big year of progression for him, stepping into this type of role, being more comfortable, more responsibility with this G2 lineup. And at the end of the day, more results for the G2 faithful coming through from the top five. How about G2 as an organization? Now you're talking about you can break up. It's not just a dynasty. You have multiple chapters of a squad that's had multiple dynasties through over throughout the years. It's crazy to think that this is something that they've been able to retool and figure out. And the biggest one for me, and I'll say it again, we've talked about it all year, Yike in the jungle, stepping in to replace Yankos and the legacy that he has carved out and built in zone for G2 for that jungler position in the LEC and how instantly the Ike has been able to step in, provide that catalyst of a difference. And man, that rel that he's rocking in the Dude. jungle, that is a, that's a scary support roaming out there in the jungles. This is a guy who can hex flash into a wall and die and not give up uh, and not steal a Baron. And you say, it doesn't matter. Because he was so damn good 95% of the time throughout the rest of this series that we don't even care. Even Yankos tweeting out saying, man. These guys look so good. Even he recognizes without him. He's like, Damn, these guys look good. Yeah, it's a different level right now, man. And I think that was part a big part of why heading into this finals matchup, 
no matter the preview, no matter the hype, no matter the focus on any of either Mad Lions or Fnatic getting through that matchup before the finals, you felt that G2 was just going to be this overwhelming force and there was not going to be a way to hold the line against this type of pressure. At the end of the day, exactly what we saw come through. A little bit of that slip up from G2, a little bit of lax at some times, and then turning right back onto the flames in game four to close it out. But you're absolutely right. Let's look opposite side here. Fnatic, what what a turnaround. This whole last split and uh, these season finals to be going as the second seed to the world championship. And you look at that matchup against Mad Lions earlier in the weekend. Razork head to head against El Yoya had one of the best series he's had in a Fnatic jersey. Now, obviously, the biggest question mark for the squad going forward is... Oscar Rennan's health going to Worlds. Wonder is under contract until I believe September 25th, which is which is obviously before Worlds. But I think the emergency sub thing can come in if Oscar Rennan is still recovering. But Wonder, the performance this guy has to get dropped into the playoffs and be arguably the best performing member of Fnatic in this series. Round of applause for the man of the top lane. Oh, he's still got it. He's still got it in that top side. Still one of the most undivable top laners in uh, in the history of League of Legends. You better be coming prepared to take the King's head when you're going up there against Wonder. This was a good, oh, really good weekend, I think, for Fnatic. Obviously, there's going to be that, you know, bitterness and disappointment at the end of the day type of thing. Losing to G2, no matter what your expectation was, but still. You have to look at the whole picture, the whole summer, and the improvements that this Fnatic team, these individuals, have made together and as themselves in their own type of uh, aspects have been some important focuses for the team. Really like what you mentioned about Razor because he's somebody that I've looked at in these international events. And, and you question the performance because you seem to, there seems to be that, you know, uh, discrepancy where you feel like the communication isn't there he's not on the same page as the rest of the team and it doesn't translate into what type of product we want to see out there on the rip the form that he's shown this past weekend the way that he has developed with the way that things have shaped up for fanatic this split leads me to be optimistic about fanatic continuing to level up razor continuing to level up as we move towards worlds and you know the crazy stat of fanatic not winning a title since Caps has been there lives on. And the problem is Caps has won 8 of 11 possible titles since he left Fnatic. You feel bad for Fnatic in that type of situation, but that just is the power that Caps has brought as a superstar to the LEC. And he has continued to bring that forth and he's been continued to be supported and supplemented with additional talent and thrills on the side of G2. Just like the old days of the G2 Fnatic Finals rivalry, you should be excited about both of these squads heading now to the international stage at Worlds to see how they can show up in Korea this year. Wasted no time. After those finals, the seedings figured out in the LEC. You had some other wild card teams qualifying over the weekend, which means Odo returns to the stage for a little bit of the play-in draw. And you heard him even joke about beforehand. You know, last time he did a draw, it wasn't so good for EU. But he says, yeah, but this is a play-in stage, so it doesn't really matter. Love that little bit of shade from him. Hey, he's all good. NAEU already locked in for that first match of the play There wasn't anything that Odo could throw out there that would be changing it up. Get some questions. Maybe someone with a little bit more information, a little bit more diving in, could see about this one. It looked almost as if they had pre-prepared all of these envelopes, set up all these matches, then just set them down for Odo to pick up and just open it up in a dramatic type of fashion. But still, thought that it was, of course, important to get this one out of the way right away after the LAC Finals. We've been waiting so long, everybody around the world, for this one to come through, even if it's just the play-ins to get some more information about it. And number two, instantly i'm hyped i'm excited it's that time of worlds we're there already baby and listen the the graphic the bracket that they used was a little confusing because you had this m6 versus t they had all these numbers and letters that but really you just have an upper bracket and a lower bracket most of these are going to be best of threes we obviously have to wait for the winner of bds versus golden guardians to know who's going to be playing that second seed team wales out of the vcs 
And, you know, BDS GG is the headliner for this whole playing stage, obviously, that NA versus EU rivalry. Uh, but GAM versus Loud as one of these matchups, that is going to be must-see TV, number one, because that is two of the most diehard, ravenous fan bases that you have outside of these major regions and even including these major regions. And listen... Loud has won three in a row. First CB LOL team to win three titles in a row. And obviously we know how dominant GAM has been. So I'm looking right at that matchup. I mean, there's there's only a handful of, of matchups when you're looking in a play-ins type of stage that can be as exciting as what it's going to be with the Gigabyte Marines and Loud facing off against each other. I think we had, you know, you got, you got to look back at DRX and RNG last year, LCK, LPL in the play-ins. And then of course, NAEU is always some nice little rivalry. But man, slip me some of that VCS versus the CB lull in that matchup. I cannot wait for how hypey it's going to be watching that. I mean, the other matchups are also just familiar faces like PSG and R7. Now it's Movistar, Rainbow yeah. 7, but you know, just a new sponsorship, same team. These are squads that have been so dominant domestically that we're just almost expect them to be on the international stage. Throw DFM in there as well, even though you have Utapon subbing in and now he's the top laner. Uh, hey, move on all the way from that drama. What a better one. Oh, no better way to do it than just uh, slide on Utapon. That's our guy. That's the face of DFM. Slow him into that top side. And you know what? My dude's good. He's been fine. He's been cleaning up with the rest of them moving on to this event. I got to just say, I am. we've talked about it before, kind of memeing on it on the TSM side type of things. I'm so happy maple is back with psg because psg stepping back into this one is a good thing it's another thing where you want to see this as an organization continue to develop continue to push what is that top level in their region but man when you got maple the veteran leading the charge for the squad it feels a little bit different i still see him in a tsm jersey jersey in my my brain is like confused like this doesn't make sense you see him dropping a psg jersey and you're like yeah that makes sense <laughs> yes sir yes it does it is good to kind of get these announcements, follow through and see what the matchups that we're going to be having for this group stage. I'm I'm so hungry for it, man. I'm so ready to get these matches, get these best ofs, enjoy the new format that we're going to have for Worlds this year, of course. Just like we talked about with the LEC format change, even with excitement, even with positives, there sure there still be some negatives and everything else to discuss. But I am so happy that we're at this time of year. It's going to be a hell of a ride, guys. We're 100% in this... Uh, stepping in the right direction. I love that there's no cheesy, you know, you lose two best of ones and all of a sudden you're eliminated. Your world's is over. It's best of threes throughout. I think even the last uh, fully qualifying ones might be best of fives. Only two teams are getting through from this play-in stage. You got to imagine the winner of BDS and Golden Guardians uh, are going to be the favorites alongside either probably PSG or GAM, which is kind of a familiar theme that we talk about in the playing stage. But those are your three expected to get through, but we know even in best of three scenarios, anything can happen. Anything can happen. And with the limited spots heading out from all these squads for that play-in ticket to go to the main event, it's going to feel almost like a mini world before it with the way that things are going to roll through with these series, with everything else playing out. And I bet you, you're going to find it. People are going to find their underdog story, their favorite, their, you know, whatever's going to come through. They're cheering for, they're happy about through these play-ins and everyone's going to join in to the rest of the feelings and enjoy getting dismantled by the rest of the group stage later on. I got, I got an achy feeling. It's sitting there. BDS and Golden Guardians, they're going to lay it all on the line on a do or die best of five. Might kind of think, nice, we're at Worlds, guys. Good job. And then they, oh, quick turnaround. You got to play Team Wales. They drop that one. They're into the losers. Then they have to complete a full run. I think whoever wins that is going to have a hell of a journey to even qualify for that main stage. I, I'm not buying into it, man. I get it. That is the LCS history to believe in something like that but I'm rolling against the clock here. I'm saying we got to go all the way back to the last time Worlds is in Korea. Who was there? Licorice was there with C9. My boy, he's back. Let's get him rolling in that top side. And I think actually the real point is we're going to get some nice Korean food, some influx for our boy, Mr. Gory, in the mid lane popping off. I think that is going to be the player that I'm really looking to make his mark 
in a, an event like the play-in stage. I guess it's just a redo of 2018. We got a top four finish for Licorice and a 3-0 against the Korean team in quarters. Yeah. Hey, right. I think any, any LCS fan will take that one without a shred of doubt. Let's go. Uh, 3 0 any of the four LCK teams from an LCS squad this year, it ain't happening. It doesn't matter if it's Dom Wan in that fourth seed or any of the other three, it's not happening. But super excited to see this format change for Worlds. We got a little teaser, little preview of what we're going to be getting at this year's Asian Games. Kespa getting a little show match between Team Korea and Vietnam, obviously. Massive mismatch on paper. Throw in the fact that Vietnam had to use their substitute mid laner coming in at support. And you got what you would expect. A little bit of a dumpstering over on Team Korea. It was Chovy who started both of these games. But he didn't really have to do anything. Because Kanavi was absolutely annihilating on the rift. I mean, uh, I don't even know why Ruler was there with the way that Kanavi was popping off, man. Holy smokes. Yes, this is our first little preview, little showcase of the Asian Games, which is, of course, a little bit of that flavor that we're getting right now with competitive League of Legends before we're going to get to the play-ins uh, a little bit later on. This was one heck of a blowout here coming through from the side of Korea. Expect it as you laid out even before understanding that there were going to be these substitutions, these type of changes. But man, what a threat Kanavi looked like on this team, especially on that Nidalee picking up kill after kill after kill. And playing such, you know, Kha'Zix and Nidalee, such aggressive early game junglers. It seemed like Zeus was at peak form playing alongside a jungler that A was giving him that much attention and B playing such early game advantage stuff. Seeing them with the Nidalee Renekton combo was an absolute treat. And yeah, the other side of the map didn't even have to do very much. You heard Ruler in an interview saying, oh, you know, people are talking about Silas support in solo queue, something maybe Kyria might go for. And he said, well, it's awkward because he's right beside me, but I hope he doesn't play Silas support. <laughs> I, I look, I get it because everybody else, everybody is a fan. Hell yeah, I want to see Silas support. I don't care win or lose, but even then, I'm thinking, yeah, someone like someone like Curious Hands could absolutely be that type of pop-off, disgusting support. Now the ADC side of it all, you don't want any of that going on with your support. You got to be keeping those numbers. You got to be keeping those kills. So I get him talking a little bit like that. And maybe he also got a little bit of those eyes towards the world's event, figuring I might have to be squatting up on the other side of Mr. Curious sometime. I hope he's not practicing that silence. Yeah, the one thing to take note, uh, you know, what he does do and scrims and things like that. And listen, we've talked about the impact that playing with these different players might have for these squads going to Worlds. Well, how about going one further? We haven't touched on. They're playing on patch 13-12 for this tournament. We're going back like six patches. How about the impact of playing on a state of the game where so many of these champions aren't even viable in what you're going to be practicing for Worlds a couple of weeks later? There's no way that won't have some level of impact on these guys. That part is extremely questionable to the organization and, and to the planning for this type of event to roll with that as the decision when you know that, again, the timeline is going to be there. And it's either way you slice it, no matter the preparation, no matter the dedication of these players, of these organizations, at the end of the day, you're setting yourself behind a lot of these other squads or a lot of these other players that do have their tickets booked for groups and do know everything else and are preparing and are focusing for that next patch even if you're quickly able to adapt all these other things it still is a little bit behind and that is one of those things where i think you, you can look at it a bit in that negative way and some of these teams they couldn't even find servers tournament realms to be playing on patch 13 12 because unless riot's giving you a specialty one where the heck are you even gonna find these and I don't know, maybe that's some type of conversation about, okay, well, you want to hold, you know, this event and you want to be pulling our type of players type of things. We don't want it to be this thing that is going to be this next little level up for your region to prepare for the world's event, a little, turn, you know, whatever type of reasoning you could ever possibly slap on here. The end of the day product is going to be 
a lower level of preparation for some of these players, for some of these organizations, because it is just so drastically different, the patches on where we where that patch is and where we are going to be for Worlds. And, you know, positive side of things, because that is a mess and hope it doesn't end up affecting these players and teams. But positive side of things, even in a show match that is essentially meaningless, just not essentially, straight up meaningless, just for entertainment and to see some of these guys on stage, even seeing the players and coaching staff walk out, listen to the national anthem, you you feel the impact of how important a tournament like this is versus even LCK or Vietnamese playoff matches. The national pride takes these matches to another level. Oh, and I love it because this is something that I want to see expanded to so many other regions and, and whatever type of format, whatever organization we got to go through, all these type of things. Having some sort of internationally based event for League of Legends where you are slotted in for your country, your teammates, everything like that. Would love to see that. And we see that here in the Asian games. We get this with these countries and these players, the pride, all these sorts of things. It's all part of that package. It's part of what makes sports in general so special for esports to have that in this type of aspect. Very happy for it. Very much want to see that continue to the rest of the world. You think LCS versus LCK is bad? Imagine a Korean all-star roster like this against an LCS squad that can't have any imports. Uh-oh. Hey, hey, man, I've been on enough school bus trips. I've seen the Miracle on Ice movie. I want the Miracle on Summoner's Rift. Come yeah. on. <laughs> you might, uh, it might need a new classification of what a miracle is for <laughs> someone to be taken down. If Vietnam is looking like this against Team Korea, and I know, again, it's a show match, but there's going to be a whole lot more absolute stomps in the way of this incredibly stacked Korea roster. We still wait for that countdown for the marquee matchup against the LPL, but it's going to be a lot of 20-minute annihilations until we get to that point. That is it today, though, for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.